Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Sea Tuesday night, talking Prague. We're going to kind of continue on a theme that we've been doing on the Hudson Valley Squares for the last couple of weeks. We're celebrating 40 years of great music from 1982. We've got another album war for you here on the Prague seat because there were a couple pretty noteworthy Prague releases in 1982 and probably none more noteworthy than the two we're gonna talk about here tonight. We'll divulge that in a minute, but first let's introduce the crew. We've got a big crew tonight and one more that's coming in late. We'll announce him in a couple of minutes when he makes his way in. We've got all the way from Scotland, Mr. Stephen Reed. We've got Anthony Ferraro. We've got Chuck Alvarez, our center square for right now, unless it gets jumbled up when the next person joins is Chad Hutchinson. We've got Rick Labonte from Canada, who's celebrating a birthday. Happy birthday, man. Thanks, guys. And he's got a new album coming out too, man. Look at A. Exactly, yeah. right? And we got, uh, once again, every single week, I am flanked by the Chicago Connection <laughs> Lewis Nasser and George Lemay on either side of me. There we go, right here. So uh, today's album war here on In the Prague Seat, we've got two very notable releases from 82. We've got Rush Signals, and we've got Jethro Tull, Broadsword, and The Beast. So like we've been doing on the Hudson Valley Squares, we're going to have each person go. We're going to talk about each album, what they like about, what they don't like about each album. And then they're going to pick which one uh, they're going to favor. And that reminds me, I do this every single episode. Got to get my notepad out because I got to keep track of the score of these. And we're going to start uh, at the bottom and work our way up. So we're going to go Stephen, Anthony, Chuck, Chad, Rick, George, Lewis, myself, and then whenever our other guest comes in. So uh, Stephen, kick us off with uh, your discussion of these two albums and your, your pick for the two. Oh, well, I did not want to be first here. Well, you don't have <laughs> and, to. And the reason for that is because I found this remarkably difficult. That's being honest. And I haven't actually, I haven't come to a conclusion. Okay. So you're so, basically, you're doing what I did last night. Did you watch the Hudson yeah. Valley Squares last night? Not, not yet. No, not yet. So well, there, spoiler there, alert, Stephen. I did the exact that's, same thing. That's it it got ruined. through my turn and I was like, I don't know which one I'm picking. So I did it on the fly. <laughs> Do you, well, do, you want, do you want us to skip you? We can skip you. You want us to? Skip no, 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 no. Yes, no, no. It's fine. No. Okay. <laughs> right. So starting with Signals by Rush. So this is their ninth studio album. Okay. So initially, when this was announced as tonight's fight, I thought that this is unfair. This is an unfair fight. Okay, mm. because you've got a band coming right off the back of you know the, the peak of their powers, realistically. Farewell to Kings, Hemispheres, Permanent Waves, Moving Pictures, you know, and it signals. Now, okay, it does signal the change, but it is the perfect link between those <coughs> albums and what follows. And as we discussed a couple of weeks ago on our most favourite and least favourite Rush album, I like what follows as well. So this falls in a bit of a sweet spot for me. So I looked at this matchup and thought, straightforward because Tull on the other hand arguably their best days are already not long gone but if you're going to pick your favorite the best Tull albums you're probably going back five years ten years so you know and so I just kind of thought of it in those terms and I also thought of it in the terms of well when I think about you know I want to listen to Rush this is quite often an album that I go for this, on the other hand, it's not really a Tull album that I go for because the other options, well, there's, there's so many other options that I think, well, I'm going to go for this one or, or that one, Aqualum, Thick as a Brick, Benefit. There's so many you think, you know, it falls a little further down my personal list in these bands, you know, but Signals has got some great stuff. So there's Subdivisions, there's the Analog Kid, New World Man, which I have a real soft spot for. I think it's a great song. I also really like Losing It, and I really like Countdown. I actually, I don't dislike anything on this album. So I just thought this was a slam dunk. Do you know, I like the start production that's beginning to come in here. I like that kind of almost bleakness that's in here. I mean, we've covered all this before. I like this stuff. 
Alex Life is maybe a bit buried for most people's taste. There's too much sense for most people's taste. I like all this stuff. So, you know, Geddy Lee's brilliant on here. That's that's the way that I viewed this. And I thought, do you know, before I get too deep in this, I really should listen to The Broadsword and the Beast. So this is album number 14, I think, is where we're at there. And as I say, realistically, they're coming off the back of a non-solo solo album in A. You know, the lineup's a little confused in that sense. There's Anderson, there's Barr, there's Dave Pegg, so that's, you know, Fairport Conventional Links, he's excellent. There's mm-hmm. Peter Jean Vitesse on Keys and Synths, who has a really, you know, major part to play in this album, which is not really the tall thing. Not always, hasn't been up to this point, really, up until A. And Jerry Conway on drums, who people know from Cat Stevens and various other things too. Do you know, but coming to this again, I was really surprised by how this stacks up because I wouldn't say I've dismissed the album. I do know it. And, and there wasn't songs that I thought, oh, okay, I, did, I forgot how that had gone. But I dismiss it because the catalogue is so strong elsewhere. Now, both of these albums, for me, yes, it's an interesting era of prog to have chosen because all the bands, all the major players are going through this evolution Keyboards are coming in, you know, there's pressures to sound current and modern, which now sounds old and dated in a way that stuff from the 70s somehow doesn't. I don't really understand it, but it doesn't. And there's a kind of commerciality in there, you know. But this is really strong. I really like this album, actually, and I'm really surprised by how difficult I have found this. I really think that Beastie which opens this as a good Scottish word, beastie, it's a wee beastie. That is a great opener to the album. And I really love the quote that, you know, the, the chant of beastie. That's, there we go. It's something that Fish of Marillion would have stolen later on when you go to a Suits album or something like that. He's stolen all this stuff. So, you know, you have other great stuff in here as well, Falling on Hard Times. That's Anderson at his best. He's telling a story, Broadsword, Pussy Willow, but it's a good song. Watching me, watching you. I really like this album and there's lots of variety on it. So I've got to be honest and say that I sat down here tonight and thought, don't make me go first. I don't want to go first because I might just get halfway down and start to even up a score. Because I've got a funny feeling that one of these albums, not sure which, yes I am, will probably- Dave Kaler from the Hudson Valley Square is in the house. Hey Steve. Hey Steve. I think one of these albums might well sneak this by a bit of a distance. And I thought I might just be a bit coy and go on the other side. Now I've got to actually make a choice and say, which one do I prefer? The answer really is neither and both, because I actually really like both of these in actual fact. This has been lots of fun, lots of fun. (laughs) And I'm going to go, I still don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It's tough. I'm going to go for... Jeff Tull, that's where I'm going to go because wow. I really, right. I've had such a good week with this. I really have. I've had such a good week with this. And the reason I've gone for it is because all of today, I listened to both these albums again this morning and then I've veered away and thought, I'll listen to other things, let them settle. And as I sat down to do this, it's these songs that I'm singing in my head. So on that strength and on that strength alone, because it really is that tight for me, I'm going the broadsword and the beast. Wow. You know what's funny, Stephen? So last night on Hudson Valley Squares, I had the, the same exact dilemma as you did. And I literally, it got to be my turn and I go last all the time. And I was like, shit, which one am I going to pick? I really thought I was going to pick the Y&T album. And then in the end, I wound up going with Kiss because I, I decided, you know what? Well, which, which are a couple songs that I like the most from both albums? And then I, I, that's how I weighed them. And that's the direction I went. So, but I, I, was, I was thinking I was going to cave and go Y&T, but I went Kiss. So, yeah, I, I totally get it. I'll Steve Keeler, right. what's going on, man? Hey, sorry. I, I thought it was 8 o'clock, like Monday nights. I'm so sorry. I'm sitting down to eat dinner and you're like, Show's starting. I'm like, oh shit. That's all right. We, we go a little early on this show because we've got Stephen from Scotland. So we, we, we don't want to. Okay, that it makes sense. Yeah. Me. I just was, I didn't even, I don't think I even asked you a time. And I just figured, well, it's eight o'clock. 
my head. Oh, well, well I'm thanks here. for making it. So just so everybody knows, so Steve Keeler, obviously uh, from Rock Fantasy in Middletown, New York, but also a regular member of the Hudson Valley Squares, absolutely begged to be on this episode. And I said, all right, we'll, we're well, I missed the, now. I missed that Rush one a few weeks ago, and I really wanted to get on a Rush episode. So, yeah. There you cool. go. Well, Steve, Thanks. we're going to throw you on the spot. So here, we'll do this to Stevens first. So uh, oh, Steve, uh, Rush and Jethro Tull. So uh, what do you got for us? <laughs> All right. So uh, to be honest, I had this Jethro Tull album when it came out. And I remember listening to it a ton. This is before Rock Fantasy even existed in 1982. And I remember having that record. And I, I, and I, I just revisited it. When I found out I was going to do this, I probably haven't listened to this album in full, except man, a couple weeks ago, I popped it on when I was out hiking, and I just said, ah, let me check out this record, not even knowing I was going to be uh, dissecting it, but uh, it's a really good record, and but it's, uh, you know, to me, I'm going to talk about what songs I like about the Jethro Tull record. Of course, Beastie is the song I remember. But that probably was the single, if I'm not mistaken. Am I mistaken? No, that's, that's the song. Back I just remember that song sticking out. The clasp has really growed on me the last few days quite a bit. First listen to it, I'm like, ah, there's no, no way it stands a chance against Rush. And But uh, now as I listen to it, it's, it's a great album. And uh, other tracks, of Mayhem Maybe, I thought was really good. Uh, Jack Frost and the Hooded Crow. I was kind of wishing I wasn't getting thrown in first because I wanted to hear everybody else's uh, talk on this album because I'm not. I think as everybody's going to say that tonight. Stephen said the same thing. <laughs> okay, I'm not as familiar with it as some, but uh, and I would say it's a strong Jeff Rotel album. Of course, I like his earlier stuff better. You know, the early, the late '60s, early '70s stuff. And you can definitely tell it's from the 80s as I listen to it. It just feels more of that, you know, the, I guess I'm in the prog seat for the first time. And thank you for letting me join you. But uh, more of a prog record than it was uh, of the hard rock era from back then, in my mind. And uh, are we giving the album a rating, too, on a one to five or something like that? I mean, or no? If you want. No. Oh, OK, OK. I didn't know if that was part of the requirement tonight. But, uh, I didn't, I wasn't going to do that with that, but uh, now going over to Rush Signals. This is an album that it's going to block my thing as soon as I do this because my microphone cuts out if anything goes within five feet of that microphone. <laughs> but uh, the Rush album, I would say, is going to be my winner. And I'll go over the reasons because I love subdivisions. I love analog. I love every song on this record. And Countdown. It's one of my favorite Rush songs. It's something about them portraying like a NASA launch and just really putting you in that moment. Uh, uh, things that, you know, uh, Neil and Rush can do with their lyrics and their music. Analog Kid, The Weapon, New World Man, Losing It, I think it's another great out, great song. As you get older, you start to relate more with stuff like that. So I'm going to vote for Rush with signals for my winner but i not taking nothing away from that Jeff Tull album uh, revisiting i'm glad so i'm so glad i get to revisit some albums with these series when we're doing our 40 years ago 50 years ago like i've been doing on my channel too a little bit and you get to revisit stuff that you haven't picked up in a while because you're always listening to new stuff or trying to race around but uh i also love the, the album co album cover award goes to Jeff Tull. i love the that album cover is great but uh Overall vote is Rush Signals for me. And thank you for letting me on and actually letting me show up tardy also for my first That's all right. Hey, <laughs> better late than never, right? <laughs> hey, Steve, I got a question for you. Do you do you find you appreciate signals more today than you did back 40 years ago? That's a tough call. Uh, when it first came out, I may have not, I think. I liked it a lot when it first came out. So it's not one of those albums that grew on me or I put away like later in the eighties, I would say the rush stuff then I kind of lost track with because I was listening more to the thrash metal scene and the heavier metal scene and what, you know, with the record shop. So I would say that this one I grew up with had it when it came out and never really disliked it ever. So I would say no on that. So I would say 
the Jethro Tull one, the one was the, what was the album that was forgotten for me. Well, this Probably has been constant playlist and rock fantasy and in my uh, you know world for many many years. And I'm going to give a shameless plug. I'll have the Rush Pinball Machine probably by the weekend in the store. They're making a Rush Pinball Machine, which is a commercial game from Stern Pinball. And it's going to, there's three different versions. And I'm so excited to get this game. It looks great. The trailers for that are amazing. My shameless plug for Rock Fantasy and Stern Pinball. There you go. Wow, this weekend. Very cool. Very yeah, cool. I should be picking it up, you know, depending on the weather. Friday, we might be getting some snow or something again. So Friday is the day I was planning on going. So it'll be there by next week, you know. So, Steve, how many pinball machines will that make in Rock Fantasy? Well, I have to probably take one down to do it. I think we're at about 40 pinball machines in the shop right now. You know, we're a record for people that never don't know anything about rock fantasy. We're a, a smoke shop, a record shop and a pinball emporium, I guess, museum or whatever. We have all the latest pinball machines. We have the classics and we're trying to get every rock and roll pinball machine. And I may even have the Elton John Captain Fantastic in the collection in a few weeks, but wow. and the only one I would be missing then would probably be the Guns N' Roses Data East and the, there's actually a Roy Clark pinball. I don't have that. I do have the Dolly Parton. So. <laughs> that Guns N' Roses machine is nuts. A friend of mine has it. It's like multi-ball all the time. The new one, the new, yeah. the Jersey Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's got a great light show, and, and you know, it does. It, it it it's quite this, you know, quite the presentation. It has a giant LCD screen with a concert going on, and clips, and yeah, it's 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 a blast. Uh, you know, a lot of new pinball. Too. You know, the Led Zeppelin pinballs came out around the same time with Stern, and uh, been a lot of fun with the pinball world right now. And crazy, crazy times we're living in, but pinball still getting more popular and the prices are going up 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 like everything else oh yeah yeah just like everything just like everything mm -hmm. all right cool well we got uh one one uh anthony you're up all right so uh the year is 1982 um you got two bands releasing records uh off this is russ is probably biggest album ever so they have to come up with a follow-up. Do they do they do they bring the goods? Jethro Tall, 1982, coming off one of the top three albums in my catalog, nobody else's catalog, but my catalog. And do why they bring that, the goods? And why is that? Uh, because of that keyboard player right there. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so we have uh, Broadsword, which was released in April of 1982. And we have Signals that was released in September of 82. Um, we're coming into like a new wave era. Uh, the police are big. Thompson Twins are getting big. MTV started to play a lot of that new wave stuff. Um, this is a tall record that has a signature flute, has a signature Martin, Martin Barr guitar, and does have a little new waviness to it. But there's some great songs, as Steven said. Beastie's really good. Uh, watching you, watching me. Um, what else was good on here? Uh, oh, falling on hard times. Ryan Colors. <laughs> then you have Signals, which, as Pete says, I think I bought this on cassette sometime in the mid '80s. I wasn't really, I didn't really hit the Rush uh, uh, Phantom to like '80, '83, '84, and I didn't get this till later on. But uh, to me, this is the one that I have. I adore this record, The Weapon. Digital Man, the bass part, the middle bass part of Digital Man by Getty is just, it's just proglicious. Uh, subdivisions, the opening keyboards, the analog kid, chemistry. I remember in the late 80s, I was reading in a, in a magazine about chemistry and Alex Lyson said that was one of his favorite solos on that record. So uh, 1982, I'm going with Rush's Signals. And this is what I have in my man cave. Let's see if I can get this here. I have I have uh, I have a I have a frame. You can't see it real well, but the, that's yeah, my man cave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I just adore the I adore the record. It's 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 very police-ish. They were big into the police at the time, uh, but there's just something about it. Uh, the weapon is just awesome. As Stephen Keeler said, losing it 
is something we appreciate more now as we're in our 50s. Uh, so I'm going with Signals, 1982. It's too easy. I will now forever, when I think of Signals, I will think Progalicious. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, two to one. Chuck. All right. Well, you know, um, this wasn't as easy as everyone made it out to be. And so, you know, once again, people would think that, you know, that this album, what's it that would be the number one winner over here. But this happens to be a pretty fine album. You know, what's it that um once again, Beastie from um the board, um the board sword and the beast is one of those songs that I always love listening to. It's one of the few songs from from this era that they usually play on classic rock radio over here in New York City. Um, the Clasp, you know, Flying Colors, you know, Broadsword, you know, Cheerio, The Seal Driver. Well, I don't think, I think this album is actually quite strong. You know, what's it, it might have a, a bit much more keyboards on it and so, but it's still Jethro Tull. And I find myself listening the last, um, I would say the last few months, listening to, listening to more Tull than I have any other progressive rock band from that, from that era. And um, I have been listening to this for the last, I'll say like three or four months, and it's just grown more and more with me. And so I love this album, you know, but when you go to Signals, you know, this, in my opinion, this is just downright perfect. You know, there isn't a single bad song on here. And, you know, the ending song, the, the last track on, the, on this album, um, Countdown, is just one of those songs that I just, every time I hear it, you know, it's just classic rush. I'm going to go with this one today and so, but not by much, but mine is actually singles from Rush, this album right here. Love it. Mm -hmm. Good choice. Any choice is good in this, in this particular mm -hmm. battle. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not by much. Mm -hmm. Not by much. Yeah, I hear, mm -hmm. you. I hear you. All right, Chad. All right. Well, let me preface this with this. First of all, I think those who know me know I'm a big Rush fan. Mm -hmm. So I've actually pulled out vinyl for, in case Ken's watching, there's my vinyl copy of Signals. <laughs> and here's my copy of Jethro Tull. It's on a post-it note. That's all I got. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but I did my homework. I, uh, since I got the invite from Pete, I listened to this, uh, to Broadsword and the Beast uh, five or six times, including today. Um, traditionally not a big tall fan but it's grown on me a little bit over the years i do really like uh thick as a brick i like alka lung um i even spoke to a friend of mine who's a very big tall fan and kind of picked his brain a little bit and um i went back and i actually listened to all the songs from the wood oh. and i think that was a pretty solid album that was sort mm -hmm. of a return to form mm -hmm. very organic um a lot of those minstrelly uh instruments but still with, with a with a rock backbone and i thought that was pretty solid and then i went through heavy horses and it got a little Watch less still good but a little bit less then Stormwatch started to lose it and got a little softer and then there was this sort of stark change uh you get to a you bring in eddie jobson and he certainly puts his flair on it you can tell it's him even if you don't know uh even if you didn't know he was on the album but you know him you know that those were his his keyboard sounds and he really brought a different, different feel to tell altogether, not just because it was keyboards, but just some of the way he writes. You can kind of tell it was him. And then he left, obviously, and we get Broadsword and the Beast. And this album, it starts off with a lot more keyboards than I thought it would. Uh, I was actually pretty surprised, even though I listened to A and was somewhat prepared. And I know we moved into the 80s and Tull and, uh, and Rush both like to try out the new technologies. And so it was all over, all over the album. Uh, from the very beginning of, of Beastie, you're getting heavy keys in the intro, but um, a lot of good Martin, Martin Barr guitar, uh, you know, guitar sla uh, stabs and flares throughout it. He does take on a little bit of a different tone, which is a little, little more, um, you know, has that 80s sort of plasticky sound at times. <laughs> But um, I think I'd lend a lot of that to the production of the album, which mm -hmm. personally I don't like. I think I thought it was rather shrill. Um, <clears throat> but focusing on the songs themselves, I did like Beastie. Actually, the first side, mm -hmm. I like Beastie. I like Clasp. 
Uh, I thought that was a little bit more mo modern. It had some vocal modulization going on. Uh, good flute though. Falling on, hard, falling on Hard Times actually felt like a little bit of a throwback, mm -hmm. a little more uh, classic tallish there. Um, Flying Colors, not a bad song, though at times it feels a little bit like it could have been on an 80s soundtrack. Um, <laughs> uh, slow Marching Band, it's okay. It wasn't memorable to me, but it was again more organic, acoustic and, and flute. Um, I do like Broad Broadsword. It would, it has got some anthemic uh, feel to it, um, sort of like a, like war drums, but and, and it's brooding. But for what it is, I thought it was a little bit too long of a song. You know, five minutes isn't long for what we usually talk about around here. But for what that song is, I thought it was maybe a little long, but not a bad song. And incidentally, that and Fall on Hard Times seem to be the singles that were released from this. Um, Pussy Willow. I'd like the song has strong melodies. Maybe for me, the strongest melodies and the, the most, the catchiest one on the album, but just unfortunate lyrics. I'm not gonna go around saying what I'm gonna be kissing. Uh, just, we're, not, we're not gonna go there. Um, then we get to watching me watching you and I, cannot, I did not like the song whatsoever. It's so electronic. It's very repetitive. Um, did not, if, if I was going to nix one song in this, in this album, that would be it very easily. Uh, Seal Driver the you know kind of slows that slows things down feels like it would be a good album closer um uh, nice and guitar driven i even mm -hmm. felt like there was a bit of an early marillion sort of uh gallop in the middle of it uh in the first half of the instrumental section uh and then we get to cheerio which yeah you know it's fine it was a very tallish kind of the way to end the album ended up being uh, an encore ender i guess in their tours mm -hmm. um good vocal harmonies but personally didn't watch me, not much for me. It's fine. I'm sure Tull fans love it. It was a fun way to sing their way out of a concert. But um, so overall, I liked it more than I thought I would. Um, I did give it. I did, like I said, I gave it five or six listens, um, and uh, yeah, I really dug into it and and sort of try to frame it with what was around it with A and some of the older material. So um, overall, I thought it was a good album. It had it was more. It was synthier than I thought it would be. It had a lot more of that 80s uh, sheen production to it than I expected, even though I knew we were getting into the 80s. Um, but still, some really good songs on there. Um, then we come to Signals. And Signals, like Anthony said, it's following up moving pictures. They don't want to repeat moving pictures, make it part two. They're trying out their own uh, technology with keyboards and whatever. So you've got Alex Lifeson trying to find a different spot in some of these songs because they're writing around so many keyboard melodies and whatever. So he's trying out different things in the background. And even though he may be mixed low at times, if you put signals in headphones and even with subdivisions, you can hear him hitting some great chords behind, uh, behind, behind the choruses and, the, and in the verses. Um, his solo on subdivisions, I've always liked. He's got cool harmonics. He's got this really cool slide at the end. If, you're not listening, you might miss it. He actually does it on the video, which is where I first picked up on it uh, way back in the day. So um, so take a listen for that if you haven't heard it. Uh, Analog Kid, it's a ripping song, great lyrics, great imagery, uh, real upbeat. The, the guitar and bass interplay is, is phenomenal. Um, Chemistry is a good song. I will say it's not my favorite song on the album. It might be a tiny bit trite to me. Um, it's got a little bit of that um, vital signs feel at times. Um, there's even a little bit of Alex doing a spirit of radio type guitar lick uh, in the uh, pre verses. Um, but good song, but not my favorite one on the album. Um, Anthony touched on this Digital Man is just a ripping bass from the beginning. Uh, the instrumental section that he sets up yet another bass line, and then Alex just scorches over it. So and that's that's a fun song. Uh, the Weapon, part two of their Fear Trilogy. Um, this is one of those songs, kind of like Red Lenses on the next album, where um, Neil Peart just puts down a, a drum rhythm that doesn't make any sense. And to watch him play something that live is, is, is incredible. It's a real solid song. Um, New World Man was the, the experiment. They had three minutes and some seconds left on the album, and they wrote a song to fit that. Um, Besides the uh, sequencer that kind of goes underneath the song and begins the song, there's no keys on it. It's classic Rush trio. There's not even a guitar solo. And it ended up being their number one song, the 
their highest charting song ever. So that, that's, a, that's a credit to them to write a, a catchy, fun song that's also a great song. Um, losing It is a whole departure for them. I would say it's probably the, the experimental song that they put on the album. They didn't, they didn't expect to play live, but they did on the R40 tour. Ben Mink with just a very haunting violin. Um, it was a song that grew on me over the years. Um, you know, with Rush, I always wanted to hear, you know, the crazy time signatures and the great playing and all that. And this, this one slows it down and gives you a whole different feel. And once you appreciate it, you realize what a really a great song it is. Mm -hmm. And then we come to Countdown, which is, you know, based on the Space Shuttle Columbia launch that they watched back in, in uh, 80, 81. Um, they actually stood in Red Sector A at Cape Canaveral to watch the launch. So that's how the, the song from Grace Under Pressure got its title. Um, the video for this, I'll never forget, had all this great imagery of, mm -hmm. of shuttle launches and control rooms and things like that. Um, maybe not the strongest song on the album, if you think of it as a, as a whole with the sound effects and, the, and the, the, the control room audio and things like that. Uh, it's a tiny bit simplistic for them, but it's still a fun song. Um, I always have that imagery of the video, so that kind of brings me back. Um, so in the end, Signals for me is a very strong album. I've always, I've always loved it. Um, uh, I think Anthony put it well when he said this is, a, or uh, Steven said it, but this is a nice bridge between what you knew with, with moving pictures and where they would go with Grace Under Pressure. Mm -hmm. um, which is one of my favorite Rush albums, incidentally. Um, so let's come to the not surprising ending that I, that I didn't pick the post-it note. Um, my vote is for Signals. All righty. Four to one. <laughs> Mr. Rick, Mr. Uh, new Album Man. Yes. So yeah, you know, here, listening to everybody talk, and you know, I'm not gonna go through track to track as a, a depth just to save a little bit of time. But I feel like I experienced the same thing that everybody's talking about. Um, when you talk, the two albums are very strong in in their presentation from start to end, and so it was a good challenge to pick. Like I thought, you know, this should be an easy slam dunk to me, because you know my Canadian royalty. Right. And I'm like, but honestly, listening to that album, I have to be quite truthful. My collection stopped at Stormwatch. I thought the 70s was it for you, uh, Jet Tall, And I didn't really go farther than that. And um, and besides, I thought they plateau. I was thinking they were coming to, you know, cause thick as, you know, thick as a brick is my favorite. Um, you know, Aqualung and Benefit, probably my favorite album of them all. But I liked everything in between. So when the 80 came in, I wasn't going there. And so getting this homework was great because I had to listen to that album over and over. And I was like really impressed um, how they were, had their feet wet with the synthesizers and the keyboard, but they still had the acoustic drums kind of like half and half. It wasn't all uh, slick production, even though there was some really some sonic um, good moment for that time. So I enjoyed uh, listening to that album. And, um, but I mean, when it comes to be truthful, uh, just in the album cover, they win for that, you know, that's awesome versus this, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, it doesn't represent, you can never judge an album by its cover anway. Uh, <laughs> Present sh showed us that in Led Zeppelin and many albums. But the fact that um, I did enjoy going through this because I saw that he was trying to make himself relevant and I love the st song. Everybody said it, so I'm not going to repeat that. But I just want to say, though, um, it was a great, um, I, I already got it in my chopping cart. It's on my way, on the way here. So it was like a Sunday show here in the middle of Tuesday because <laughs> I ain't up buying it. Um, but, you know, I have the history with Rush and Signal for many, many reasons that everybody talked about the song. And, you know, I love losing it because they actually looked like they jammed and they caught it on tape. Hey, that was cool. Let's, you know, it was like an improvisation. It feels that way anyway. But all those songs were well put together. And But back in the day, though, um, as my story tells everybody, I started off with Primate Wave, right, because of my age. And I was always listening to the older kids' music 
all my life and uh and they were uh playing this stuff but so i got to move them pictures to get signaled it was a little dip for me a little bit because by then i had everything so i saw progress going here from 2112 you know fairway to the king hemisphere permanent wave moving pictures like that they're like you know drum roll please how can you beat that right so signals are already was set to disappoint me a little bit because of the high standard but i enjoyed it because it reminded me of the uh the time the video game the uh, it just felt like 1982 when i listened to that record i can remember the the fashion i can remember the attitude and so it's like going into back in the future car and going back way to 82 though and experiencing the video game sigma um the roller skate just the cranking the tune um i felt that vibe through this album again so it's nice going back through this because it's almost like going through the youth now maybe i'm getting more sentimental because i did turn a birthday today but when you go back to this it was like a little slot of you know looking at a photograph for a long time and you start experiencing everything that come around that album so obviously for that reason this album will win uh but i gotta say it was a great experience to listen to that album uh brought door the beast um it's definitely glad to have it has a spot in my collection for it right uh, but anyway, this is the winner. Should be no surprise. All right. Five to one. George. <laughs> I'll echo what a lot of people said is that I thought this was going to be a landslide. Uh, I hadn't heard Broadsword in quite a long time. Um, uh, probably a good decade. But I did remember that. I always thought it was the best of the 80s records. Hey, aside, Anthony, I mean, just a bit. Of, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and they, to me, they assimilated the 80s production artifacts better than some, a lot of the other prog bands did. Like, I would listen to this before I listen to 80s Genesis comp to compare it to oh. what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, song by song, I really like the clasp. I really like Falling on Hard Times, um, Pussy Willow, Seal Driver. Uh, the, to me, that's the good part of this. Uh, it doesn't get too low. Uh, the uh, you got your standard softy tune and uh, cheerio. I could uh, deal without. I don't really care for that. I'd probably be skipping that from now on. But uh, overall, I was pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed this. Signals, like everybody said, it's the album after the glory days in a lot of ways. But I. I was, they were my favorite band at the time it came out. I was waiting for that to come out. And when New World Man hit the radio early, you know, it just had that big buildup. And it sounded different. So we had a little early struggles. I didn't really like chemistry that much in the beginning. And I didn't like losing it. But as the years go on, like both of those songs now, especially losing it. Mm -hmm. One song I have a little difficulty with is Countdown. I think the the overdub voice it gets a little tiring for me. It's not a bad song. It's just if I'm listening to this album, sometimes I may pull it a song early. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need to hear that, but uh, uh, the good parts of this Analog Kids a top five brush song for me probably. Mm -hmm. and, uh, same, same. To me, this is Neil Peart's best album. The weapon that that beat that Chad was talking about. That is a beat that drum machines were new at the time and one of the roadies got one and it, it played it randomly and they showed it to neil and they're like listen to this can you play this and he's like i don't know but he actually learned it and i actually learned this too it took me like two months to get this one beat which is amazing because the the bass drum is playing a quarter note pulse it couldn't be any easier mm -hmm. a basic amoeba can play it but the hands are so weird it's just that song always amazes me. So for me, this is Rush. I'll say like by eighth round KO, I go signals. <laughs> All right. Yep. Lewis. Okay. Hey, Stephen Keeler, what do you what do you think of this record? But uh, uh, you know what? Uh, you, you, uh, it's the one I haven't heard probably since it came out. So I'm not a great judge. Oh, really? I, have take, I have to take a listen. Mendy. <laughs> Here's your answer, Anthony. As That's you can right. guess, Anthony's a big fan. 
He hates that album. This but, is one of Pete and I's favorite tall records. <laughs> well, well, I love the album. <laughs> you keep forgetting about me. I have to. I have to revisit it. I, I, I haven't put it on my list to listen to, but I haven't listened to it in a long time. I'll say this about these two albums. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details because everybody said a lot of good things, right? Right. right. There is. There is there's there's two aspects about these records. I think that um, the two bands were moving in different directions at that time. I think that if we if we if we remember that the Broughter and the Beast was followed by Walk Into Light, mm -hmm. the solo record by Ian Anderson, and from there they went into you know under wraps. There was going to be a, a precipitous fall, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as I've always said. If you listen to the actual compositions of Ian Anderson, they're always amazing. The problem, of course, is in the instrumentation and how they are put together for the listener to enjoy. And the average person doesn't have to fucking deconstruct it, right? They just have to enjoy it or not, right? But, um, but in my mind, um, Rush did moving pictures. Then they did the, the dog is about to pee. And then they did... <laughs> Grace Under Pressure, which I'm going to agree with Chad. Grace Under Pressure is a phenomenal album. It really is, history. man. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. It really is. The songs in, on this record are quite good. Although, for the life of me, I can't understand why they allowed Lifeson to write lyrics for chemistry. Like, if you have <laughs> Peart, what are you doing? Like, is it a joke? Like, is it, is it supposed to be funny? I don't know. But they did that, right? Fine. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not like it's been said before. It's not the greatest song. I, I also agree with George. Countdown. You know, not everybody can pull off the sound effects as well as Roger Waters can. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't do them correctly, then it, it ends up being a gimmick. Right. It's glitchy. It's, it's just, you know, I, I don't know. And, and, and that's kind of the thing. Like when Russia rocking, they rock like nobody's business, right? They're they're amazing musicians. Um, you know, we all know this. But uh, out of all the records, this this one has songs that I absolutely love, and songs that I always skip over, right? In contrast, Broughtard and the Beast is a record which I like everything on it, and I'm even more impressed now that I know what is the stuff that didn't make it into it. I know. It's, it's, uh, Brother Keeler mentioned, you know, Jack Frost and the Hooded Crow and other songs that are not on the actual release, but they were from oh, those yeah. sessions, mm -hmm. right? Jacqueline, Jacqueline, Jacqueline. I mean, the, yeah. so some of the stuff they left off is better than what they put here. Yeah. And, and and what they put here, I I just like everything about it. I mean, to me, Pussy Willow is a beautiful song, right? It starts in A minor and then it modulates to B flat minor. And it's a beautiful thing, right? And I don't mind the lyrics. I can talk about kissing Pussy Willow all day long, and I'm happy, right? We're not surprised. But, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a great record. You know, mm -hmm. Flying Colors is a, is a, is a very clever lyric about, about these, these conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Clasp, Beastie. This is very much a Cold War record, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways. It's mm. the Cold War meets the mythology of Jethro Tull. That, that album I love cover. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I absolutely love this record. So and and to top it all off, like everybody else, you have your history, right? Mm -hmm. I never heard this record until I was well into my 20s and I was doing my PhD at the University of Maryland. This was not part of the bootlegs that I got as a kid, and I never mm. even knew about it. So once I had cash, I started to buy up all the rush records. And the thing I don't like about this record is that I, I tend to, to think about Rush in terms of innovation. I'm not that keen when they're imitating, whether it's the police. This is an experimental record as much as this one is. Mm -hmm. I find that the, the guitar sound is, is just, they didn't quite get the right amount of chorus on the guitar. It's a little bit, it's not just that it's mixed low, it's that the EQ, it's just, it just, it didn't work, right? You, you're missing one of the three top ingredients, right? For the sound, for me. Well, one of the and, reasons um, he did that, I read, was he took a lot of the chorus off because it was competing with that same yeah. frequency as the, uh, as the keyboards. 
exactly. Yeah. So they they got it they got it <laughs> right later, right? But but for this one, I even though it has all those keyboards and it does have the dreaded gated reverb on the drums, which I really <laughs> hate, hate, hate. Um, I nonetheless, I love this record. It's, it's just one of those that I grew up listening to. This was actually one of the first Tull albums that I could buy with my own money, even as a teenager in Mexico. I bought it, right? I stood in line and I bought it the day that it came out. And um, I just love it. And I'm even more impressed by it now that I know that it could have been even greater, mm. right? Whereas with this one, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not objectionable in any way. The weapon is brilliant. And I I mean, New World Man is kind of like the, they're paranoid, right? It's the filler that made a hit, in a way, right? But um, it's uh, it's it's a great record. I mean, but it's it 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 has songs that I skip over, and even though this one has its softies, you know, I like them, you know. And Cheerio, I, I am a big Tall fan, and I do love this in the live concert. It's a great ender, mm -hmm. right? After they throw out the balloons and they do all their, it's it's fun, you know. So it has a purpose, right? For me, at least. So. I'm going to give it to Broadsword and the Beast. Although, of course, we are talking about very finely shaved pubic hairs of, of, of distance. <laughs> On the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not like, a, it's just that um, this one has a sentimental value for me, I guess. Right? I can relate. That's my story. I can Pete, can I, can I say something real quick, Pete? Sure. Uh, what I want to say was, like you, have, like, you have these two bands, and they have the history but the, the the stuff that's in the tall vault compared to Rush didn't have anything in the vault that we know of. But the, the, the stuff that was in the tall vault could have made up another what four or five extra albums. I mean, Ian was just like yeah. in, in just in just in the same in writing all the damn time because I don't really think he was much into the booze and the drugs in no, the seventies. No. I think he was just writing all nope. the time. Nope. Yeah, nope. and you know. People were talking about how this record has a lot of keyboards. Let's not forget that the 70s tall had two keyboard players. Yep. Mm -hmm. David yeah. Palmer, now D. Palmer, and John mm -hmm. Evan, who was a guy who was yep. also doing all the writing of all the sheet music for everybody else because Ian Anderson doesn't write music, right? He mm -hmm. Well, he composes, but he doesn't write it out. So mm -hmm. he has somebody that he has to have that job for. They had two guys on stage doing it. It's just that these are more digital sounds. As opposed to the other ones that are more like the organs, the pianos, you know, the, That's right. the, the you know, the, the monophonic synths and all that stuff, right? So now, but, Luis, Eddie Jobson took up what two people were doing on one album with one person. Just remember that, okay? I, I remember it. I, I also, I, I also wish it had been just as memorable. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it, but he did okay for being Eddie. <laughs> At least they had white jumpsuits. That's true. Oh yeah, and they and they released that video, the slipstream. That was fun. I don't know if you. Oh, guys... it's so good. Oh yeah, it's pretty. It's good. Look, I'm a big Tull fan. I'm not. I'm not. I I, I like A a lot. I love. I a. think that what Jobson did on on Black Sunday and all those other songs is brilliant. But we're not talking about that record. We're not no, talking I... about Jobson. I mean, you know, to echo now, in uh, in July, the box set for that's coming out. Yes, I'm gonna be buying that because this is one of so my hopefully, favorite. So hopefully, hopefully they release the live in Germany, which I have on bootleg, which is a fantastic soundboard. I'm assuming that's gonna be the live uh, CD that they put in the box. Set. Let's hope. Yeah, we'll see. Well, you know, I mean, you know, to, to echo your point, Anthony, I mean, there is no other band that has as much shit in the vaults as Ian Anderson. Like fully fledged songs that, are, that were left, that were recorded at the sessions of all these albums, left off the albums, and arguably some of this material is as good as what made the album. Yeah. And, you know, the remaster of this has got like That's all these great songs. So you, I yeah. guarantee you that when the box set comes out, you're gonna get <laughs> all gonna be these more. songs and there's gonna be others that we've never yeah. heard before. Remember how, we, yeah. I mean, remember how we always spoken about uh, a passion play, uh, album that I love immensely, but I like, in my opinion, <laughs> love it. I love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is crazy. So yeah, I mean, Ian's just got all this stuff like always just sitting around, which is you know, which is great. Of course, it makes you buy these albums over and over and over again, right? You can <laughs> on to but but at least you're getting new shit, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you're not just getting the same old with a slightly better quality of the image 
and a little different liner note from some douche that you don't really care about. It's the same record, right? It's, it's, it's actually, he's giving you new content. Yeah. Or he gets Stephen Wilson to remix it, and you get to hear different aspects of them. So that, that, that to me, is, is value. This is what I wish, especially for guys like you who buy everything under the sun. This, this, is a, this must be a curse, right? You want them to give you extra value. I mean, I don't know how pissed off I would be if I bought it and it was the same thing. Just, you know, give it a little tweak and just reset ah! it. <laughs> like, no, no good, right? The curse is very real, I'm telling you. It's very yeah. Real. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very real. I hear you. So, so, Pete. It's, so it's six to two. So obviously we already know, you know, what the outcome of this one is going to be. So my vote doesn't really matter much. But I will say, so going into this, um, I started re-listening, not that I needed to, because I know these albums, both of them really, really well, but you, know, you got to revisit them again. So uh, I've been listening to both of these at the gym for the last like week and a half, like one after the other. And, you know, I have, uh, we'll start with this one. So I bought this when it first came out. The reason why I asked Steve Keeler early on if his appreciation for this album has changed over the years, because I remember when this first came out, I was a little taken aback. I liked it. But I was like, wow, this is like kind of like moving pictures and permanent waves, lightweight a little bit. But I mm -hmm. like the songs. I saw them on this tour, you know, I was like, and over the years, though, I have appreciated this album and Grace Under Pressure like a lot, a lot more. Mm. And a couple of you mentioned that basically this is as close to perfect as you can get. I mean, yeah, there, there's some, you know, there's a couple songs on here that maybe i don't like as some of the others but man subdivisions analog kid digital man the weapon, weapon. i mean these are great songs losing it um new world man is kind of fun but not my favorite on the album and i like countdown i think it's pretty cool i like the production uh, again it's not as big and bold i think as moving pictures or you know as heavy as some of the other stuff before it but i think this is rush for the new era because rush always seems to after a live album they start something fresh and after exit stage left just like after all the world's a stage begins the new era that's what rush does so i like it i think it's really good uh it's very memorable and i still i think i enjoy it more today than i used to mm. the broadsword i did not buy when it first came out because i didn't really get into tell heavily till like the late 80s early 90s so I was a little later to the toll game than some people, but this also holds up really, really well. And I think it also I has so. aged well, even though you think that it shouldn't, but it does because the songs are so good. Like Lewis mentioned, I mean, the songs are really <laughs> memorable on here. They're really enjoyable. And I almost like, part of me is like, because I kind of was doing what, what Steve Keeler was doing. It's like, you know, you start listening to all the other session tracks from this album. I did, yeah. I and did. then all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's all this great stuff. But then I had to dial it back. I'm like, but some of those were not a part of the original album. So I said, I have to look at this from Beastie to Cheerio and forget great tracks. Like Jacqueline is amazing, right? I love that song. Uh, mm -hmm. Jack Frost and the Hooded Crow is great. Uh mm -hmm. Too many to overhang. I mean, these are just great songs. But I was like, all right, let's forget about those. It's still a great album. I mean, I like Slow Marching Band. I think it's kind of cool and majestic. Pussy Willow, I absolutely love. Uh, Seal Driver is great. Beastie, the class. I like this album a lot. But this was really hard. Like Stephen Reed, I came to this episode. Actually, yesterday, I was going to go in one direction. And I changed my mind this morning. But then Steven started talking right off the bat. And I'm like, oh, shit, should I go back? I'm like, I hate it because this is two nights in a row now I've done this. And yeah. So, but again, my vote doesn't really count in this instance because, you know, Rush is already going to win this one amongst the panel here. But uh, it's so close. Today, I'm going to give it to Signals. I might change my mind tomorrow because I really love this one a lot. And so I think I. this is one of Tull's underrated gems from the 80s. You know, they got, a, they got a handful of albums that some people like a lot, some people don't, right? Uh, I dig most, of, except for Under Wraps, I like all the other albums that came out in this, in this era. But I think this might be the best from the 80s, you know, Crest of a Knave is up there as well. But um, yeah, I'm going to give it to Rush, but it's really close. Uh, uh, this is my favorite from the 80s, for sure. On mine. Yeah. Hmm. 
Wow, well, I enjoyed it. Because, like, in Crest of a Knave, Tull was trying to sound a little bit like Dire Straits, a little bit like ZZ Top, right? <laughs> yeah. They were going for that kind of a vibe. And, and again, it's the same observation that I have with this. I don't, I don't want them to try to copy anybody. I want them to be themselves. So that was the only thing for me with Crest of a Knave. With, with Crest of a Knave, I think Crest of a Knave has like four outstanding songs and the rest is okay. Yeah. And then and then they this really committed that's solid committed that, that that cardinal sin of the drum machine with steel monkey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a little far for me, right? But mm -hmm. you know, yeah. But I think you know, like Rock Island, I think gets gets shit on quite a bit. I don't have an issue with Rock Island. I love oh, Rock, Rock Island. Island. I like Rock Island a lot. Yeah. Right. The Whalers dudes, man. Great song. Yeah. It's hey, Pete. <clears throat> In my opinion. The best post broadsword album is hands down Rooster Branches. That album just kills. Yeah, I would agree. Oh yeah. Although if you haven't heard uh, the Zealot Gene yet, it's pretty damn good. I haven't heard it yet. I'm waiting for mine to arrive. Yeah, it's pretty damn good. Uh, I think it, and, and Stephen could probably talk about it a little bit more than me because he's had it a little bit longer than I have. But I think it touches on a lot of different eras of Tull. All good. And it, there's a lot of variety on the album. And I'm surprised at, at how good it is, actually. Yeah, I am too. Um, I have a review up on the web scene now. Uh, and I've overstated the mark. Well, maybe a little bit. Because at the moment, I think it's a really good album. Really good album. I was pleasantly surprised when I first heard it, that it stands up. Because we're so far down the line. And there are key members not there, in my humble opinion, that I was quite worried. So, you know, I, I really thought that the time had been and gone and we sh maybe shouldn't bother at this stage. It's much better than that. The more I've lived with it, the better it's become. So reviewing it now, I'm really impressed. I've got a funny feeling that coming back to it in time to come, I will like it even more. So where it will rank overall, I don't know. But it's really impressive, especially considering where we are in the catalogue at this stage. On a personal taste, the production is maybe just slightly too now for my own personal taste. Um, I don't think Tull have ever sounded quite so clean, if that makes sense. However, it's not enough to really spoil my enjoyment of it. I'm really impressed. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody else thinks too. Yeah, I you know, Anthony, you mentioned Roots to Branches. Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities for me to that album. And I, I, it's leagues better than JethroTel.com or JTel.com, which I'm not a fan of at all. It's way better than that. I think it's it's also way better than Catfish Rising. Absolutely. So, you know, it stacks up there as one of their, their strongest albums over the last 40 years, I think. Yeah, and I don't think there's really much doubt about that once you've lived with it for a while. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. So uh, I, I generally, what I try to do when we have these big panel shows and we have a center square, seeing as we're wrapping things up, uh, Chad, you are our center square today. Any final thoughts uh, of today? And it doesn't have to be anything related to what we talked about today. No, I think I, I, it will be about this. And uh, this was uh, this was a great exercise for me because like I said, I wasn't, and I'm not a huge tall fan. I like some, I haven't dived into the, the discography uh, nearly what some of you guys have. Uh, and to pick one from the 80s, which I was like, oh boy, it's not one of their classics. I'm going to have to listen to something that might be off their classic beaten path. I was a little concerned and um, I didn't want to rush to judgment. Like, oh man, this album's going to suck. Signals is going to win. This is going to be dumb. Um, <laughs> but I spent time with it. And I have to say, after listening to it four or five, six times, yeah, I enjoy it. I, I, I like a lot of the songs on here. Um, I had to go to Spotify to listen to it, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, I spent good time with it and, you know, now I know what's coming, uh, when I go back to it, I think I will revisit it. So, um, being, being pushed to, uh, to dive into this was, was a great experience. And, uh, I appreciate you letting me be part of this, this panel, even though you knew where I'd probably lean, but uh, I, I did give it a very fair shot and, uh, it was very enjoyable. Appreciate it. Oh, same here. Yes. Exactly. And see, Rick Rick went and ordered a copy. I, well, Rick, now you know you're going to be ordering Rock Island. You're going to be ordering Roots to Branches. Just be wait. Just be wait. Well, I was impressed. I was. 
Yeah, Rock Allen and Rooster Branch are two very solid choices. Yeah, yeah. What was interesting too is that um, the Signal Doctor had a, a guest on to play violin, like Ch uh, Chad had mentioned, and I was kind of daring for them. But by then, they figured they already proved everything, so they're now going song structure. So I kind of appreciate it. But like everybody said, it was uh, it actually grew on me. But when I got the remastered, I seemed to we loved it more. To everything that I was missing really popped out. The remastered is part of the trip too, I think. Uh, listen to Signal, you appreciate it a lot better than back in the time. And uh, But for this album, it's brand new, so I'm only hearing it already remastered the way it is today. And I have to say, it was ear candy for me. I love the I love all the performances. I was really impressed. I thought everything was already done in the 70s. So if it was more like that in the 80s, I'm, I'm got to dive in. But, you know, Russ still wins it because of the memories and everything else, but that was a great experience. Yeah. Yeah, so we got uh, seven to two in favor of uh, Rush signals here over Jethro Tull's Board Sword and the Beast, but uh, everybody watching, please uh, cast your vote down in the comments below. Remember, there's no right or wrong answer, just based on what you like, right? Two great albums here. They're both winners in our books, but uh, yeah, yep. you're going to pick one. So, uh, and if you like this kind of format, album war from 1982 tune in to monday night on the hudson valley squares we'll be continuing our way through february doing these uh album wars from 1982 we got a good one coming up monday we've got uh, two live albums black sabbath live evil going up against ozzy osbourne speak of the devil wow. this will be interesting because we've got some really divided opinions among the cast on these albums so <laughs> i already know what butch is gonna pick uh, no <laughs> no <laughs> Uh, Butch, is already, Butch is already warning Chris Allo to be nice. <laughs> we can take bets off of this show. <laughs> it's going to be a fun one. So stay tuned yep. every night for that. It'll be, it'll be loads of fun. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay bad. tuned for another episode of In the Prog Seat next Tuesday for Steve Keeler, Stephen Reed, Anthony Ferraro, Chuck Alvarez, Chad Hutchinson, Rick Labonte, George Lemmy, and Louis Nasser, Ian P. Pardo. Good night, everybody. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Good night.